bear with me as I'm a little bit more still so I can stay on this mic. And I don't want to go over time. And the problem is with a talk like consumerism, waste, and resistance, um, I could weave in hundreds of environmental authors who have been talking about this for uh, a little over a hundred years. So I want to keep myself on schedule. The premise of this lecture is simple. We love fictional characters who resist, who fight back against injustice and destruction, yet we don't feel comfortable with real life activists who attempt to do the same. I teach writing classes based on the environment and sustainability. And one of the units that we um, work through is research-based fiction. Students are asked to take the most pressing, converging concerns of our time, usually environment, economy, and social justice, and to imagine the impact these issues might have on the future, depending on whether we deal with them now or we don't. Why fiction, you might ask? when the environmental degradation of our planet is so very real. Well, we live in an age of information, lots and lots of information. And because we're constantly inundated with information, we have turned into skimmers, multitaskers who quickly soak, soak up the surface and move on and on and on. But responding to the damage being done to all forms of life by the empire-sized giants of global industrialism and consumerism isn't a job for skimmers. Usually it's too much to take in, too much to feel without succumbing to actual despair, or worse, to self-loathing, which, as Wendell Berry suggests, will do none of us any good when it comes to action. How can we act out of love if we hate ourselves? Fiction helps us to feel basic truths through empathy. We can safely immerse ourselves in the problems and ideas of our time by fictionalizing them. Derek Jensen, who's quite an activist and author, illustrates the safety of fiction in his parody on the Star Wars story called Star Nonviolent Civil Disobedience. You can watch this video on YouTube, by the way, or at endsiv.com. For those of you who aren't familiar with the Star Wars story, here's a brief setting-based breakdown, because setting is always the most important factor in fiction. So a synopsis. A long, long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, a trade federation gave rise to an evil empire. Backstory. There was a trade federation that controlled trade among the galaxies. And as best as we can figure, it was, as modern environmentalists write about globalization, referred to as a race to the bottom. To be under trade federation regulation was to be a planet economically enslaved. Wages were low, living conditions poor, and environments destroyed. There was a democratic republic with a Senate and Jedi Masters who attempted to maintain social justice and balance. But over time, the Trade Federation bought off or began to occupy Senate seats, creating a machine of greed and power that became ripe for consolidation. Enter the evil empire and its key figures, the Emperor and his enforcer, Darth Vader. Democracy breaks down, order is maintained through fear, and the emperor rules by force. Even the Jedi scatter. Yet a band of rebels continue to fight for the good fight. And this is where Jensen enters the story. He begins his star nonviolent civil disobedience talk with a brief explanation, fictional of course, of the real story behind Star Wars. I don't know if you know this, he says, but the original Star Wars story wasn't written by Lucas. It was written by a group of environmentalists. Now in the big screen Lucas version, Luke Skywalker, Jedi Knight, fends off Darth Vader and the TIE Fighters and blasts a torpedo into the thermal exhaust port of the evil empire's Death Star, the second one they've tried to construct, just before the Death Star's 
planet-destroying power ray is about to blow up another planet and quench the rebellion for good. But in the environmentalist version, more peaceful tactics are applied. Activists write letters to Darth Vader, asking him first to be the change they seek in the world. You might hear Gandhi or maybe even Michael Jackson there, be the man in the mirror. When Darth Vader does not reply, they go to the top, filing motions and pleas with the highest decision-making body of the empire. They arrange eco-tours of the planet about to be destroyed to promote empathy among the wealthy, the industrialists, and corporate CEOs. And in a final move guaranteed to move the emperor to a change of heart, activists gather on the about-to-be-destroyed planet as the umpire warms up the Death Star, and the activists join hands singing, Give Peace a Chance. Of course, we all know how the real story goes, right? This just illustrates, hopefully quickly, and when Jensen does it, um, it's quite funny in some ways, um, what Derek Jensen's books have been talking about for a long, long time. We have been too kind to those killing the planet. We have been inexcusably, unforgivably, insanely kind. I want to share with you uh, the kernel or the, the moment of convergence for me that started the need or the want to put together this brief lecture. Um, last year, with other professors here at GRCC, I was sitting in a Native American literature class taught by our longtime former director of sustainability, Dr. Gary Burbridge. We were studying um, a Native American author named N. Scott Mamaday. And Mamaday is considered and called the dean of Native American literature, at least in a modern written sense. And in Mama Day's story, um, the novel On the Way to Rainy Mountain, he recounts a story of the Kiowa tribe, his tribe. Um, and it's a story called The Night the Stars Fell, or at least that's what it's been called since then. The Kiowa tribe awoke in the middle of the night to a, a shower of stars so bright that they were convinced something was desperately wrong in the universe. And of course, you would think so. When you look at this woodcut um, that attempts to capture the density of the meteor shower, which we now know it probably was the Leonid meteor shower they were seeing. But to the Kiowa, that showering stars foretold what would become their acceptance of a series of blows to the tribe. Um, this story helped them explain, understand, and even accept when disease with the white settlers came, when smallpox came and they were dying off in huge numbers, when they were herded into smaller and smaller places far away from their own native homes. This story helped to explain for them some cosmic reason why they were bound for destruction. And I remember taking that in and thinking about all of our future fictions. And I rattled through my mind and tried to find one in my decades of reading and movie going that showed um, human behavior changing. Um, and I couldn't. And I asked myself literally in that class out loud, wow, is this what we're doing? telling ourselves stories that fit a model of destruction. So let me take you through a quick fictional tour of some of the ones that I have picked out decade by decade. Um, we'll start with the 70s, Soylent Green. Um, about the same time, a writer named Paul Ehrlich went on the Johnny Carson show, get that, most popular evening show, three times to discuss his population bomb essay and a future of overpopulation, Soylent Green hits the screen. And as viewers, ask yourselves if you identify with the scoops or with our main character. We urge Charlton Heston's character, an intellectual cop of sorts, 
who is part of the system that controls the overpopulated planet, to rebel. We want him to expose the government and the food it doles out for what it is, processed humans. Processed humans who dare, out of hunger and poverty, to act out against their government. Riot control, in this world where population is out of control, gets a protester the scoop. In the 80s, we had Mad Max and the World Road Warrior series. Um, think about the destructive power of nuclear weapons and how it left its imprint on generations born after World War II. And the Mad Max series showed us a world without food or energy or laws. As the 70s turned to 80s, President Jimmy Carter delivered a speech, remember the oil embargo, and he asked Americans to stop consuming and wasting, to accept limits on a finite planet, and to plan for a future without oil to burn. But here, there was a future where savagery and brutality reigned. And we certainly weren't rooting for the gangs of men searching for oil who roamed and robbed and raped and pillaged. Somehow, we wanted moral fiber and decency and love to win. In the 90s, climate change turned the world over and covered it in water. In this water world, people tied together any materials they could find to create tiny floating communities and the most valuable commodity of all was anything green that they could tend to and grow. And we're not rooting for the oil barons this time, floating in the decrepit shell of the Exxon Valdez. The smokers, as they're called, because they have noisy engines that puff in dark clouds. They are the only ones with any oil left. No, we're rooting for the unlikely hero who happens to be a loner, a sailor, part fish, part human, after a lifetime at sea. And he may be the only one who can lead this young girl, the focus of the story, who has a map of some sacred, mythic land etched in her back, a place of green and plants and promise of a life to start over. And then, in the new millennium, a major role reversal, Independence Day. Environmental colonialism, colonialism hits home when an entire species of space-traveling aliens comes to consume all of Earth's natural and human resources. For some reason, they feel entitled to our planet, our communities, our lives, everything we are supposed to cherish. I can't say it gets that much better when we look back at the current year. In The Road, Cormac McCarthy's novel turned movie, a father and son head south across what was the United States in a world dark and scarred and burned by some manner of disaster, which doesn't seem to matter exactly in a definitive sense. What we know is that humans have nearly destroyed life on Earth, and father and son have only one certainty. If roaming cannibals manage to capture them, they have two bullets in the gun, and they will use it on themselves. And then there's Avatar, a story that certainly aims to directly confront our culture's surreal dependence on technology, even, at, even as we use it to destroy nature and sustenance. In a reverse reversal on the Independence Day theme, humans have colonized the planet and are attempting to dislodge the indigenous population because their homeland, this huge ancient tree that you see winding through the middle of the image, sits above a great deposit of natural resources humans have named unobtainium. Stop and think about the name, unobtainium. If conquering and controlling is the challenge, will this story ever stop? I must say, at the end of this story, it would have been more fictionally pleasing to me if after the corporation decided to blow up the ancient tree, that the leader, the corporate CEO on the planet, wasn't allowed to leave unscathed when the indigenous population did manage to chase the corporation away. For now. 
So I kept asking, if every one of these stories of conquest and control and competition for scarce resources was preparation of sorts for a future in which we, what, stay the course? And then came Wally, -E, a children's movie of all stories with a clear message of resistance. And hopefully after Annie Leonard's documentary, The Story of Stuff, you'll also see the cycles that spin uncontrollably with consumerism. So why resistance in a children's movie? Oddly enough, Wally's screenwriters have been asked about the movie's environmental message and they insist that they had no intention of making the environment a central focus of the film. What they wanted was a plot device that could help them explore their real theme, which was isolation. So how can portrayal of a garbage-strewn, toxic, uninhabitable Earth, an entire planet piled high with the waste of our super-consumeristic ways, not make a statement about our need to save the environment before it's too late. Well, perhaps it does, even if the screenwriter writers didn't set out to make it do so. So I want to give you my take briefly on Wally from an environmentalist literary criticism perspective. We could call this Environmental Literary Criticism 101. A pre-tour of images to take note of when you watch our upcoming main feature. Note first the advertising on the space station lifts. By and large, the global retailer has convinced humans to leave the mess of global consumerism behind. Amidst evidence of widespread pollution and environmental destruction, do humans stop consuming? No. They listen to what current cultural critics call the weapons of mass distraction. These are people stuck in a story of an economy that must grow to survive, and to grow means to produce more and more products that consumers must buy, throw away, and buy again. And if there's students of mine here, you know I could go on for hours about that mythic place called Away, right? That we throw things to. By and large, lit billboards still run on vacated Earth day by day as Wally, a small robot, passes them by. And through these billboards, we get the backstory of how and why humans left. Global retailer, by and large, convinces humans to keep consuming, to take a ride on the space station axiom while someone else cleans up their mess. Sounds a bit like what environmentalists and energy experts call magical thinking, that we can simply keep consuming and someone else will invent something to get us out of this mess. So enter the axiom, transport and space station accommodations for a garbage-weary society. Of course, you have to wonder when you see this big ship, with a price tag that such a ticket must bear, who exactly could afford to take that ride? Surely, with garbage piled high and higher than the skyscrapers, a population capable of producing that much product wouldn't fit on a single space station. So, while some, presumably, humans go off on a magical, technologically enhanced vacation voyage of their wildest consumeristic dreams, Wally -E and other robots 10 times his size, have been left behind to clean up the mess. And 700 years later, Wally -E ends up taking, excuse me, Wally, -E, the only functioning robot left in sight, toils away at compacting and stacking his tiny garbage cubes. To make a long story short, Wally -E ends up taking his own space ride with an unlikely friend, another robot named Eve who catches Wally's eye. So off we go into space. And I want you to note something when they do pass through Earth's atmosphere. Notice the by and large billboards on the post-colonized moon. And notice also the layers and layers of space junk. You may laugh, but remember, our government and NASA have at times supported the idea of life on the moon. 
and other planets. Currently, the count on planets outside of our solar system, called extrasolar planets, sits over 400. There's a lot of technology being invested in trying to find Earth-like planets and Earth-like water. Why? Well, why not, just in case. So once inside the axiom, the real melding of environmentalism and resistance begins. There's a continuous voiceover aboard the space station that soothes, by and large, everything you need to be happy. Your day is very important to us. When you're floating in space, disconnected from any sense of place, looking beyond the shortest increment of time must be awfully painful, perhaps even maddening. Thinking for today and for day only is the key to survival in this world. Education, education also begins early. Babies, sequestered from any adults and apparently parentless, learn to recite, A is for axiom, your home away from home. B is for, by and large, your very best friend. Don't kid yourself, corporate advertisers have been targeting our kids for years. But this is fiction, right? Would parents really leave their children in the hands of corporations if they were able to control the content of their education? And the adults? Well, adults hover in chairs, never making actual contact with any ground or each other. Surrounded by techno screens, they are immersed in their own personal disreality, a world where consumerism is life where advertising is real, where what appears on screen is life and life outside the space station is nothingness. The captain in his daily message delivered to lines of automated humans says, I'm sure, 700 years later, that our forefathers would be proud that 700 years later we're, we're still doing exactly what they were doing. Hmm. Sounds like a mass marketer's dream. Finally, a truly captive audience. A full-fledged rollout of the weapons of mass distraction. Until that is, the most human machine of them all comes in and reminds the real humans that this cultural story, consumerism, is a machine of mass production and consumerism, is a machine of their own making, and a machine they can willfully purposefully break. They only need to resist isolation. So enter Wally, -E, a dirty, beat up, sun damaged old ro robot, into an environment that is all about sterility and control. Life, after all, is organic, messy, grainy. Ecology is downright dirty. In fact, any robots who aren't towing the corporate line are confined, diagnosed, disinfected, and cleaned. And it is in this community of misfits that Wally first finds his first community. Now, call me crazy, but this is where the outright theme of isolation and the inherent theme of resistance combines for me into a truly environmental message. Even humans who have been held captive by consumerism and technology can change. And once Wally sets the rebellion in motion, it doesn't take long for a few well-connected humans to start behaving, by by and large standards, very badly. John and Mary, the first humans to see life beyond their screens, are energized by their first touch. In their first act of activism, they use their tiny, fat, unexercised toes to splash and short circuit the robot that keeps watch on their behavior. The captain, doing a bit of research on his own, discovers the illusion of life aboard the Axiom and the potential for real life back on Earth. Earth is in trouble, he says. I just can't sit by and do nothing, which is, of course, exactly what convenience coddled humans have been doing aboard the Axiom for 700 years. Did I mention that the CEO of the planet, the face we see in every earthly billboard, 
was originally the CEO of By and Large? For the most serious implications of that image, look up the definition of fascism. Meanwhile, as the space station tilts and humans have become so obese and unexercised that they can't walk, and they slide across huge sterile floors, John and Mary become parents of sorts. In a bold move, they encircle a slide of pile, a pile of sliding babies and think for the first time in their lives of a generation beyond their own, of life beyond themselves. So why is all of this in a kid's movie? Well, this is where Wally's screenwriters and my own interpretation meld in resistance, in place, connection, and love. Think about this. How can a parent watching this story of acceptance, of garbage and filth and waste all based on the most temporary of conveniences, explain such behavior to the child they're watching Wally with who sits there with them on the couch? It's a small environment. It's a close environment. It's hard to escape. And anybody who has a parent knows your children can incessantly question your behavior. Which brings up the ultimate environmentalist message. Sometimes love is an act of resistance. People connected to each other in their places cannot trivialize or destroy those places. And they certainly wouldn't teach their children to destroy their futures, would they? A is for axiom. B is for by and large. I'd like to end with a brief explanation of love as resistance from Kathleen Dean Moore, a philosopher of nature who was interviewed by Derek Jensen, the author I previously mentioned. In Kathleen Dean Moore's words, obligations grow out of relationships the philosopher Nell Noddings pointed out, and she's right. We know what it means to care, and we value that. Just as we are connected to our families and care about them, we are connected to the land, both emotionally and biologically. This is the starting premise of something often called deep ecology. We are all members of a natural community of interdependent parts that includes rivers and wrens and children and stones. The relationships define us, sustain us, create us, fill us with joy. And when we find ourselves alone and apart, our unhappiness becomes a longing close to grief. This is so, if, excuse me, if this is so, then to lead a moral life, we have to acknowledge the depths and complexity of our ties to the natural communities we are members of, acknowledging our own experience of caring, acknowledging the value we place on caring, and we need to commit to acts that grow out of love. Aldo Leopold says, sing our love for the land and our obligation to it, and I am struck by how quickly obligation follows on the heels of love. What is called for are not just acts of enlightened self-interest, but acts that grow from our connections and acknowledge the worth of what we care for so deeply. A right act isn't the one that makes us happiest. A right act is one that strengthens and renits the web of relationships. And so it tends, as Aldo Leopold said, to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of our communities. Figuring out what's right in any given instance isn't going to be easy. You have to learn about your natural communities, how things fit together, what makes communities flourish, what weakens their bonds. You have to simply do what might be called the study of the ecology of love. Thank you. Um, at this time, we're going to start Wally, and hopefully you'll note those messages and images and have a fictional, let's hope, follow-up to the story of stuff.